Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, new user seminar. Where I'm going to be going over uh, the Nix package manage, which is a very new thing that we've put on SharpNet, sort of as an experimental thing to see how this turns out. Um, our hope is that it'll, without much effort on our part, on your part, it'll bring a lot of additional software packages to SharpNet for you to use. So a quick overview of Nix. Nix was a project coming out of a thesis on uh, package management several years ago, and it's uh, so it's been around since early 2000s, and it's grown quite a bit since then. It's a, a new approach to package management. We'd call it a, the enterprise pa uh, approach. I don't know of any other software that does it. The closest would probably be the uh, TMG files on the Mac OS. So the idea is you have uh, your software in entirely contained modules, and then you just plunk those modules in and they run. So in Nix, what we mean by a package, it's a specific piece of code compiled in a specific way. So if you compile the code differently, that's a new package. So each package is entirely self-contained, and it does not change after it's been compiled. And what that means is uh, users can share the same package. So the system tracks that automatically. It sees if you're asking for the exact same package compiled in the exact same way, and it's already done that, it'll just hook you up to the existing one. And it also means each user gets to select what package they want, and you and they get a custom environment. So every user can say, I want you know this Emacs here compiled with this options and this BI and uh, this GNU block. So the Nix web page is nixos.org. Um, so they took this package management system and actually built an entire operating system out of it. We're not interested in running the Nix operating system, though we're just interested in their package manager, which is Nix. So it's, it's sort of like if you're familiar, you have uh, Red Hat and Fedora, they use the RPM package manager. Debian uses the D package manager. So Nix operating system uses the Nix package manager, but you can use the Nix package manager on other systems. And as of today, they're up to several thousand packages that they have created, so we can automatically bring those in and install them on our system. So I'm just going to show you now this, this link here. So if you bear with me, I'm going to switch my uh, views here. This is just over to a web browser. So this is the Nix OS packages. You can see it's showing one of uh, roughly 13,000, then you can search by a package name. So, uh, I mean, for this example, I'm going to be mostly talking about Emacs, but it's the have a look for GNU plot Emacs and Vim just for something to do. So I have a couple of different versions of uh, GNU plot. These are all the packages that have GNU plot in their name. So it looks like there's some Haskell stuff that uses GNU plot too. So they have a, a Qt. So this is probably compiled up with the Qt libraries. And an aqua term, I would expect that's actually for the Mac OS. I should mention Nix, the Nix package manager runs on Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux as well. And then this is probably just the standard one. So you can click on it, and it will give you a bit of a breakdown here, their home page, uh, who maintains the package. And then this here, and we're going to be getting into these a bit more later. This is the Nix expression. So if we click on that, that'll take me through to the actual uh, configuration commands that are used to compile this package. And you can kind of, it, it's pretty simple, but you can kind of get a sort of idea. This is the, the dependencies that, so it's got, you know, X11 and XO and Pango and Karyo and and then here's the, you know, tells it where the URL is, and this is the build inputs and the configure flags. So there's a, a with X option. So you can enable or disable X, enable or disable QT, enable or disable Aquaterm. And then just a little bit of description about it. So this, this if you actually want to create a package yourself, this is the type of code you have to wear. Use. Uh, from our perspective, it depends how deep you want to go. If you just want to install packages, you don't actually care about this. If you want to override some of the options, then you want to have a look at this file to see what, what options they've exposed for you to override. So what, what do we hope to do by putting this on Sharpnet? What do we get? Well, it allows each user to have their own custom environment. 
so we'll get into that later. But uh, you know, you could have GNU plot with Qt installed, and someone else can have GNU plot installed. Um, and these environments should work everywhere. So if you're on a, a VDI machine or a Viz machine or any of the clusters, since they're entirely self-contained, they have everything but the kernel. Um, they will they will run on any machine. Uh, now there is a bit of a caveat there. They are compiled with a newer version of glibc, and the newer versions of glibc have a hard dependency. They require kernel 2632 or later. If you want, you can go read all about it at this link here. Um, so Requin is out. Because Requin's Red Hat 5 and the newer glibcs no longer support that. And there's nothing Nix can do about getting around the kernel that the actual system is working. And of course, as I said before, uh, they bring several thousand newer and newer packages to SharkNet. So uh, yeah, so I've already talked about the glibc, and currently um, you can use the packages, but you can't actually manage your environments. You have to set your environment up on a cluster, and then that environment is usable on the Viz and VDI machines. And that's just because the, the build system is on our internal network, and the VDI machines are on our external network, so they can't actually contact the VDI machines, the, the build machines to request them to do their builds. You have to do all your environments set up on a internal, so a cluster node, or I mean cluster login node. Um, probably we'll be able to resolve this though with some forwarding of appropriate ports. So Nix, the way we install rolled Nix out for now uh, on the system is we put it under a user Nix build and the SharkNet system, and this automatically makes it available on all the machines because all the machines mount our user account. Um, and then there's just a, a bash profile shell script that sets up your environment to access it. So if you want to use it, you just source home nix build profile.d nix profile dot shell. Um, and then that, that, that will last for the length of your session. And when you log out and log back in, it'll reset back to uh, you, you won't have your environment set up anymore because this, this is a bash command and it only lasts for the length of the bash session. If you want to enable it permanently, then you just add this line to your bash profile. And then every time you log in, this line will be ran. Now, if you want, if, you know, if you're playing with Nix and things go badly, it's actually fairly easy to remove. You just, all the files in your personal directory have this .nix prefix. So you just blow away all the .nix files and then if you want to do a complete reset, then Nix also maintains some state of your environments and your, your garbage collection routes. So you can remove these directories too. So uh, this is sort of a soft reset. This won't erase your environments you've set up, but you know, if you're playing with the packages and stuff like that, and stuff gets screwed up for your configurations, you can erase this. If you want to remove all your environments that you've created, then you can erase these directories. And then next time you run the Nix profile shell, it'll notice that these directories don't exist and will recreate them with the defaults. All right, so here I am on my own computer, quite at its call. Um, so I'm going to secure shell into the cluster. Let's go into Orcraft. All right, so I'm logged in. And now I'm going to, since I've had Nix set up, I'm going to do my Nix reset first. Um, so I actually want to preserve my stuff. So I'm just going to move all my Nix files into this temporary directory. There we go. And then I'm going to remove my uh, my Nix my Nix state directory. So that's Nix home Nix build bar Nix profiles per user Tyson. And my uh, groups. And you can see I've actually modified my bash profile, so I'm just catting it out here so you can see, to automatically uh, source the Nix profile setup script. So let's log out and log back in. That'll be resourced, and now I'll be back to the defaults. You can see it'll have recreated some of these files. So that that's how you actually uh, access Nick 
for Nix for the first time. That's the entire setup. So you saw I sort of did it in reverse order. I did a reset and then I did a, uh, a setup. So feel free to do this on your own if you want to have a look. Um, so we're going to jump over now to talking about the Nix environment, which is, I mean, you know, you want to set up your own environment to use. So the Nix environment command is what you use to maintain your environment. And you can use the Nix environment command to query your package, and you can list available packages and installed one. You can use it to create new environments from the current one by adding packages, create new environments from the current one by removing packages, switch between existing environments, and delete unused environments. Now, I'd like to draw special attention here to the fact that I say, notice I didn't say by adding packages to your environment, I said create a new environment by, from a current one by adding packages. So this means, uh, I mean, the programming lingo, environments are non-mutable. So it, instead of, it doesn't modify your environment, it creates a new one, which means you, at any point you can always roll back to the previous one, and if something goes wrong, you're not left with an environment in half a state. It'll be trying to create a new one, that'll fail, and you'll just be left with the old one. So how do you query patch packages? Well, the Nix environment query, or minus Q for short, command queries packages. The common flags you want are the minus A. By default, it queries the packages you have installed. So you want minus A to list the query the available packages. And uh, this displays the package names. And several packages actually have the same name because they're the same package. They're just compiled with different options and such. So usually you want a minus P, which displays what they call the attribute path, which is an unambiguous identifier. The minus minus description will add in a description of the package. Now, querying all of the available packages, you saw there was 13,000 of them, is actually quite slow um, because each of those packages, is, the details are maintained in a separate file and it's mounted under a whole mix build, which is an NFS file system. So I recommend you run this command once. Um, and this gets all of the queries, all the available packages along with the description and saves it in the Nix packages text file for you to reference in the future. Uh, you can expect that command to probably take upwards of I don't know, maybe a minute. So now if you've identified, you've had a look at your packages and, and you identify some packages you want to add to your environment or I should say you want to create a new environment with these packages in it, then you use the install command, or minus I for short. Uh, now, I would recommend you use the minus A to install by attribute. By default, it installs by regular expressions on the name. But if you use the attribute, uh, then if you, I mean, if you install by a regular expression on the name, it has to enumerate all the names first, then you're back into waiting for approximately one minute. So use the minus A, that's the unambiguous attribute, and then that'll get you there really quick. Now, if you don't want, if you want to just create a fresh environment, so you don't want to take the current one and create a new one by adding a package, then you can specify the minus R, and that'll start with an empty environment and add the package you want. So here's an example of some commands. Um, so Nix environment, install by attribute, Nix packages Emacs, and Nix packages BIM. And then we'll do a Nix environment Q, which if you recall from the first slide is a query. So let's just jump back over to our console here so we can run these commands and you can get an idea how this goes. Okay, so Nix environment. I'll run a, well, first of all, I'll show you the output of that uh, Nix packages command. So this is the output you'll get. So this here on my left is the attribute, which is the unambiguous uh, identifier for it. The middle line here is the package's names. And then the far right-hand side here, fairly large, gives you a detailed description of what the package actually is. So if we jump, if we just search through this file here for Emacs, packages Emacs, See this various Emacs related stuff. There we go. Um, 
So if I want to, I can refer to it by name, 245, which I don't recommend, or I can unambiguously refer to this as mixed packages, Emacs, and then it's, you know, GNU Emacs 24, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure you can uh, So let's install that. It's environment query. So I'll first have a look at what's in my current environment. Q, you can see, return nothing. So nix environment install attribute mix packages emacs and mix packages so and that goes and builds me a new environment with these packages installed in it and that's all you have to do to install a package oh yes um, now at this point here, I should probably jump forward in my talk. This I had previously, so nobody has installed Emacs with X11 support in it uh, because I had set up my own configuration because I didn't really want X11 support. So because this is the first time that's been installed that way, it's going to go ahead and it's going to download all the libraries it needs to build GTK and so on and compile them up and install them for me. This is going to take a while. So I'm just going to abort this. We're going to switch back over to Emacs without X support. So to jump a little bit ahead in our uh, talk here, I'm going to make a mix packages directory. And then I'm going to copy my mix packages config file to there. And uh, we'll get into more details of what's in this file. I'll just show you here. Um, basically, I override the Emacs package to turn X off. And when you turn X off, you have to turn GTK2 and GTK3 off as well. So let's install that instead. So now this is just a small list of packages, and I imagine these are probably being picked up by uh, the VI because I've actually done the Emacs install. So the very first time a package is, is, installed, is compiled in a particular, is has to be installed in a particular way, it goes and gets it, and it compiles it up with your options, and then it's stored, and next time you get it right away. So we're just going to let that build away in the background there, and we'll go back to the uh, talk. Okay, so you've seen how to install a package, and you've seen how it uh, it downloads it, and then I caught ahead of myself because I had to, and showed you a little bit about how you can customize packages as well. So to remove a package from your environment, or I mean, pardon me, create an environment with a new packet with, a, with one less package in it, is the nick environment uninstall command, or minus E for short. Uh, and now this is done by name. Because the for technical reasons, the technical reason is that the attribute path actually identifies the commands used to compile it, and once it's been compiled and installed, those aren't available anymore. So, but it, by name is not a problem when you're removing a package because if you're removing it, you're re, it's because it's already installed. So this only does an implicit query to the match the names of the over the installed packages, not all the available packages. If you recall right, it's all the available packages, but there being 13,000 of them, that takes a long time. So here's an example of removing um, Vim from our environment. And then we're going to run a minus Q, which will show that we're back to just having Emacs. Now, I've been talking this time here about our environments and how we can have multiple environments. So every time you create, every time you add a package or remove a package, it just, instead of deleting the previous environment, I mean, modifying the previous environment, it creates a new environment from that one. And the reason it does that is this enterprise feature, so it can support rollback. So if something goes wrong, you can just go to next environment, rollback, and it'll bounce back to the previous. If you want to get more involved in that, you can use next environment list generations, which will show all the environments you've created, the times they were created. You can pick a particular one with the minus capital G here and switch to a particular environment. And then you can tell Nix environment as well that you don't need those generations. Uh, this is a good thing to do periodically because there's actually a garbage collector that goes through and looks at all the packages that have been built. And if they're not needed by anybody's 
uh, environments anymore, then it can free up that storage space. So here's some examples of some commands. We've got a Nix environment. We list the generations. We do a rollback. And then, um, so if we'd ran these previous commands, we'd have the, the, the uh, we'd have the first one with Emacs and Vim installed in it. And then we remove Vim, so we have just the one with Emacs installed in it. And then we have two generations. We do a rollback. This takes us back to Emacs and Vim. So if we do the query command, we'll see Emacs and Vim. We switch to generation two, so we're back to just having Emacs. And then we delete generation one. So that's an example of uh, creating your package. All right. Well, and this compile here is still going on, so I'm gonna I'm gonna shorten this down a bit, and I'm gonna just drop the the whole Vim thing, and I'll just show you with Emacs because Emacs is something I've actually compiled already. So just abort that. There we go. So next environment query. We've got Emacs 241. Uh, if we ask the computer where is Emacs coming from, you can see it's now using the Nix profile in Emacs. And if we run this Emacs, we can see, oh, yes. Tell, this is an important command. Tell uh, Bash to, Bash remembers where commands are, and it, uh, so this tells it to redo its memory. And then we run Emacs, and you can see. So before here, it was picking up on the system one, um, and I ran Emacs command before, so Bash was remembering that. So I told it to drop that, and now you can see it's loading the new Emacs that I just finished installing, which was 245. Now, if we do an Nix environment list generations, you can see we have a, a generation with uh, an environment with one generation in it. Okay, so let's install um, ATOM. Oh, sorry, that should have been by attribute there. You can see how long that takes when you... So ATOP is a sort of a more advanced top. And you can see this is, it's already got, there's not a whole lot of dependencies in ATOP. Uh, I mean, besides the basic system, which it's already got installed. So there it compiled it up. It's in my environment, which ATOP, there we are. Now we have this fancier top of it. Okay, so now we have actually some additional programs installed. So next environment, uh, list generations. You can see we have two generations. I'm on the current one. And now if I do the next environment rollback, bash to forget about what commands it's memorized from where. You can see ATOP is not in my environment anymore. Um, Emacs, of course, will still be. And if we do a list of our generations, you'll see now I'm on generation one as my current one. So if I want to reset myself to my previous generation, I can just do top to generation two. Now, a tops available again. Emacs is still available because I asked it to uh, for Emacs version. Um, I asked it to install it, so I just added it to the envi previous environment. And uh, if we do our list of generations, um, now we can let's get rid of that previous one. So delete generations one. There. So now I've just got the one generation. So that, that's basically it. I mean, if you just want to use it to install some software that you wouldn't be able to install otherwise, um, you just source the file. You do a, a QAP, QA capital P, and pipe it out to file to get a list of all the packages that are available. Or you can search uh, from that link on the website. Uh, so one caveat about that is that the version of the package that are available on SharkNet is slightly newer than the versions of packages that are listed on the NICOS page. So there's not a hundred percent correspondence there. 
um, but it's pretty good. So the, the authoritative place is the minus QA peak, which QA capital P query available uh, include the path attribute. And then you just mix environment and install minus I and add it. Mix environment minus T to remove it. All right, so let's go discuss uh, some configuration here again. But let's discuss how it is that uh, and how this, what's actually going on behind the scenes with these commands. Uh, I mean, this is not stuff you have to know in order to use it, but I always like to know what's actually happening. So let's talk about the environment internals. So Nix is, is on Sharknet. I mean, if you install classic Nix, it's actually stored under slash Nix on your machine. But in order to exploit the fact that we mount home accounts, we put it under home Nix build, and then we didn't have to modify any of the clusters. So the packages are stored under the home Nix build store directory. Um, and it's stored out into individual packages, quite a bit like if you look through the op sharknet. If you see op sharknet, it'll be op sharknet GCC and then some version number and another version number. And this lets us install more than one version. Uh, but Nix takes us a step further. So the, the directory includes the name and instead of a version number, it includes a hash of everything that went into creating that package. So the hash includes the, the dependencies the hash includes the compiler options. The hash includes the version number. And then this is how it is that Nix um, can support you know, the same package, same version compiled in different ways. And it's also how it is that if you ask for it compiled the same way I ask for it compiled, which is what happens in the majority of cases because normally you don't override the setting, then it looks and says, oh, hey, wait, but it's already been done with all those options and just gives you that directly. Now, an environment is actually a package that Nix creates, and that package contains bin, sysbin, lib, the sort of the standard directories, and those directories are filled with symlinks to the components of the packages that are installed in that directory. So, for example, in, the, in my directory, uh, my, my package I created, there will be a symlink to Emacs, and there'll be a symlink to ATOP under the bin directory. So that's all an environment is. An environment just pulls all the pieces together with symlinks and, uh, and creates a fake directory structure. Now, uh, each user has their list of environments, as you've seen. This is all the ones they've created. These environments are stored in, these, in this profile directory. You recognize this maybe. This was the directory I had mentioned you could erase if you wanted to do a more complete uh, Nix set. So home Nix build var Nix profiles per user, uh, Tyson in my case, profile dash uh, generation. What the first one was one, the next one's two, the next one's three. And that links to the associated environment package. So the environment package again was the one that actually contained all the sim links to the executables in the libraries. Now the active environment, so the one that I, you know, when I say rollback, it changes the active one, or if I say switch generation, it changes capital G, it changes the current one. There's a special file under there, uh, which is just profile. So it's like pro profile without the dash, and it links to whichever profile is currently active. And this, this is how Nix achieves its uh, atomicness. Um, so it builds your environment, and it sets it all up, and then it just changes one sim link, and then that becomes active for you. So the last step, the, the, you know, the, 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 where it writes out this profile link um, is what enables it. So we're, we'll have a look through my directory structure here to have a better idea of it. All right. Now, how does the actual system find this? Well, when you source this Nix profile shell, all it does is it adds the Nix environment uh, first to various system search paths like path and man page. Uh, specifically, it includes Nix profile, uh, being Nix profile, S bin, Nix software profile, share man, and the man path, and so on. And Nix profile links to your profile, which then links to whichever profile is active, which then links to the executables. Uh, now, on top of all this, we also have a default Sharpnet environment, which uh, is so far, it just has the Nix uh, 
commands installed with. I mean, if you didn't have this, you wouldn't have the mix commands, so you, you couldn't go around installing new packages. So this is sort of the bootstrap system. Uh, and these are just under the var and mix profiles default. And it's a first generation, so it's default. Points to default one, and then default one points to the mix commands themselves. So uh, that's probably, probably very confusing hearing that all, but let's go have a look, and hopefully it'll become more clear. Okay, so not very exciting now because I only have one profile. So let's um, let's query this profile just to see. You can see I have ATOP and Emacs installed in it. So let's go ahead and remove Emacs. Alright, and you can see here it actually kind of hinted, it built a path, so it created a new user environment, which is what we're calling a profile, and then it created sim links, which were for the ATOP commands and stuff, into that environment. So now let's have a look, let's have another look at our, our profile, uh, next environment, next generations. So now we have generation two. Remember, I deleted generation one. So generation two, which has ATOP and Emacs. Generation three, which just has ATOP. Now, how does it find things? Well, let's have a look at what my path is. So let's actually let's rehash my path for starters. It's a bash, a bash thing. It doesn't seem to notice when you change these some of these directories underneath it. So you can see the first place it looks for a command is home Tyson bin and then it looks under home Tyson mixed profiles bin. So let's have a look at that mixed profiles directory. Ah, you can see mixed profiles is a, is, a, is a redirection. It goes over to home mix build r mixed profiles per user Tyson profile. So let's have a look at this directory here. Now, profile is a link to my third profile. That's because I'm on generation three. And look, there's two profiles here. There's profile two and profile three. So profile two corresponds with generation two, profile three corresponds with generation three, and it's profile three that's my active profile. Okay, now let's have a look inside that user environment. You can see there's a bin and there's a system bin directory. Let's have a look inside the bin, bin directory. Now, uh, in this case, because there's only one uh, package installed in this environment, it's just a direct link to ATOPS bin directory. And, and the SBIN is a direct link to ATOPS SBIN directory, and the share directory is a direct link to ATOPS share directory. However, if I go look at profile three, here. Uh, profile 2, pardon me, which has more than just one package in it. You can see bin is actually a directory, and under bin, the various commands, atop links to atop, emacs links to the emacs package. And uh, these other packages, the Emacs package includes an e-tags and apparently a grep change log command as well. And ATOP has a couple ATO parser and so on. Anyways, so I think that will hopefully give you an idea of how this is implemented. So uh, when you ask to install a package, it connects to our next build server, which is on our internal network. So that's why you can only modify your environments so far on cluster nodes. Um, and then that will go and it'll create these directories, build the required paths for you. And then uh, it sets up an environment, a new environment with those executables all sim linked in there, creates you a new profile to it. And then with one command, it moves your profile to the to point to the new generation and suddenly that environment becomes active. And if anything goes wrong in the prior steps, uh, there, it isn't a problem because it's not until that very last change of what your current profile is that uh, things actually change. So if we go back and look at home mix build uh, for mix profile per user, 
Python again. So again, the very last step, it creates a new profile. It'd be like uh, first it sets it up. If it sets it up successfully, it'll create a profile for link. And then the very last step, it bumps my profile to point to the profile for link. So if anything at all goes wrong in there, I won't see it because I'm still on profile three until that very last step. So that's the atomicness of the system. All right, so let's move back over to configurations. So um, I should emphasize here, I'm trying to go start with the basic stuff, which is just how you would install it. And then that, I mean, that can be all you need to know. Uh, if you want to know more though, I've given you a, a information about how it works. That's not necessary to understand to use it. And uh, now I'm going to give you information about how the configure how to do the configurations, modify your configurations, which is also not necessary to use it. So let's talk about the Nix configuration. Uh, you actually wound up seeing this a little sooner than I intended because uh, I didn't want to sit through and wait for. Emacs to do its full compilation step. So this is only necessary if you, you know, if you're wanting to compile your GNU plot with some strange options, or your Emacs, or your VI, or your Paraview, or whatever it is you want to use. Ah, so now packages under Nix actually are expressions that tell the Nix builder how to compile the package. So a package is actually directions to the system about how to compile. Ah, these expressions are, you know, actually quite readable, and you saw I clicked through on one here. So if we go back, Nixos Orange Packages has a searchable directory of the packages. You can just type in the name like you saw, and it comes up, and you can look ask to see the environment. Um, now the packages on Nix on SharpNet are actually newer snapshot of the packages than those provided in the link. So the definitive reference is actually the actual packages files on SharpNet, not the ones on the website. And you can see them at, under this location here. So I, I mean, generally maybe start on the website and have a look, see what you want to do, and then actually dig into the real package to get the details. Now the all packages file contains all the packages, uh, and it's quite big because there was 13,000 of them. So you, you normally want to you know, search through and find it. So for example, it'll have lines like this that say Emacs equals Emacs 24, Emacs 24 equals call package applications editor Emacs 24. And this tells you that the actual configuration file or the actual package expression for Emacs is under the application editor Emacs 24 directory. So let's go have a look at that. First of all, we will start with the uh, an exhaust package thing here again. So here is the website if you go to it. And let's have a look at Emacs. Um, no, there's an Emacs no X. So it's already, they have a version that's disabled for you. Oh, I could have installed that instead of messing with my configuration. Um, Okay, so here's our description, and if we click through to the Nix expression, here's the Nix expression that is used to compile Emacs. And again, one of the things you notice right away is it has the with X option. So that would imply you can, can compile it without X. Uh, I mean, now that I see that there's an Emacs and the Wax package, I would actually recommend installing that one instead. But because uh, we want to see a configuration, let's go with this. All right, so that's sort of what the website looks like. Um, you'll notice what I was saying about this being older. There's no GTK2 and GTK3 stuff in here. So that's the stuff that um, they have added to it since with the newer version. So in this case, you actually do have to look to see what's installed on the system. So here we are back over at my, my login here. So the Nix packages is, is something called the Nix default expression. So that's the expression it uses by default. And as I said before, these expressions are tell it how to build stuff. So if we have a list here, we can see the Nix packages is actually over on here. So let's just, uh, let's just follow that assembly. Okay, so here I am in the Nix packages directory. 
And uh, by default, when you load the NICS packages, um, it loads the default expression. And, and you can chase these two if you want, or you can just have follow my link. The default imports packages top level all packages, which is why I told you to just load packages top level all packages. Okay, so this is the complete list of packages. And let's have a search through it for Emacs equals. There it is, Emacs equals 24. Emacs 24 equals call package application editors Emacs 24. And you can see they have uh, themselves overridden a few things. It looks like they've disabled the sound. Who knew Emacs had sound, but apparently it does. Image magic, XR. Uh, so let's have a look. So it goes up one directory, so we go up one directory, that's what the dot dot means. Applications, editors, Emacs 24. Um, the default mix expression for there. And here we have the actual package file itself, which differs slightly from the one that the website shows up. In particular, it's picked up some GTK options. And we can see from these asserts that if GTK2 is set, then you had either, either better have with X enabled or you better be on Darwin. Same with GTK3. So if we're going to disable uh, GTK, I mean X, we've got to disable GTK2 and GTK3. So anyways, I hope that gives you an idea how you can sort of uh, look through these things. Uh, I'll show you here a little bit too if you want to look down into it. So the actual package just says, so it's a standard environment, make a derivation, there's the name, here's the shell script that'll build it. Um, here's the URL where to download it. Here's the hash of it. Um, here's packages it requires. So these are input packages. XML, GL, GN utils. Um, here's some configure flags to pass to configure. So um, if with X is set, then it passes these. Otherwise, it passes with X equals no. And here's some post install stuff to run, so that's after it doesn't install. So the default package, uh, the standard environment here, go back up, does the standard configure, make, uh, and make install. So it's got all sorts of little hooks you can throw in, post install, pre-configure, post configure. And then finally down here is just the meta description of it. So the description, the home page, whoever the current maintainer is, what platform it's surprised, what the long description is. That's what is extracted out of the website. So that, that, is, that is the complete package file. Now, uh, I mean, if you want, you can add your own packages, in which case uh, you'll have to write up an equivalent sort of file. And if, and if you use the standard autocomp stuff, so your package actually does do a standard configure make, install, then that's pretty basic. If you uh, if you have some other weird configuration system, then you'll have to uh, redefine the configure and install phases. So uh, me, Emacs is a pretty advanced package, and you can see this is pretty straightforward. Anyway, so let's go back to our override. So under your own directory, there's a mix pa uh, mix packages, and you can put a config file in here. Which basically, we just split my screen here back again. It just basically says um, package overrides. So this takes the current package set and it takes the Emacs and it overrides the arguments that were passed to it. So Emacs was Emacs 24 and these were the arguments that were passed to Emacs. It overrides them by adding a with X and a with GTK 2 equals false, with GTK 3 equals false. And then it redefines Emacs that way. So that's, that is all it takes to uh, go in and edit some of these options that are being passed to us. And then I rebuild, and, um, and that's it. I mean, I should be able to see, actually, I think there's was supposed to be Emacs no X. Uh, now that's sort of interesting too. Oh, here we are, Emacs no X. So yeah, uh, it's just the exact same thing. So in, in their case, they uh, took the Emacs 24 override, and they set X to false, GTK2 to false, GTK to 3 false, appended no X to the name, and made it a low priority package. Which means, if you happen to have it installed in the regular Emacs at the same time in your environment, it'll default to the regular one. Now, again, no, I'm, I'm not expecting, you know, people are most likely not going to be writing in their own packages. It's just 
you know, you want a newer version of GNU plot, so be in Nix environment, install it, and that's as far as you use it. But, um, I mean, it has a lot of package options. It can pull source code out of GitHub and stuff, so you, I mean, you could easily uh, create a, a package expression for your software and then give that to any other user on SharkNet, and, uh, you know, they can use the most recent one all compiled up for our systems. Now, by default, it, it uses the GCC compiler, and I don't believe there is a um, an X11, I mean, pardon me, an Intel compiler packaged for it yet, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so, so yeah, standard Emacs support in X11, the associated mix expression, this is what we've already seen here, um, so I'm just going to tell you what you saw. So you can see here's the inputs that it takes to build this. Um, some of them are optional. So with X is true unless you're in Darwin again, so unless you're running on Mac by default. Um, and then some asserts to make sure, you know, if you've got GTK2 enabled, then you better have X enabled. GTK3, you better have X enabled. So we go into our Nix package config. We want to set with X to false, with GTK2 to false, and with GTK3 to false. And then that's as easy as uh, creating this here. And we just say package overrides, take the current packages, um, take the Emacs in the current packages, set these variables to false, and then we assign it to Emacs. So that's how you do a complete uh, package override. Now, uh, moving on to how do you package up your own packages. So I want to create my own packages, so I go under here. Currently I've got the Nix packages. Uh, the channels is just a broken sim link to this here. You can add, uh, it's for, there's a whole Nix channel command which lets you add other people's packages and it downloads them over the internet, their package expression, to your environment. But I'm not really covering that, so. We'll make a directory, my packages. My packages create the default mix expression in it, and the default mix expression will take uh, the mix packages, and this here runs it with no options. Um, you can do various things. I can say system equals i386 minix, for example, uh, and what that will do is that will create all the packages I list in here, it'll compile them for 32-bit mode. The system defaults to your current system, which is 64-bit. So I don't really want to do that. So let's just add my Emacs equals uh, the mix packages Emacs, which is the one that's in scope because of this with statement. Packages uh, override. And let's set uh, with GTK2 to false and with GTK3 so by default, Emacs is being built with X11. Um, so this is going to switch it over to using GTK2 and GTK3 instead. Actually, and because I've overridden it somewhere else, I may need a with X11 equals true in there as well. All right. Now, assuming I haven't made any errors, we'll just do a query. Have a quick look in case it's obvious to me how uh, how I screwed that up. My package is default. Ah, yes. Um, so this should be an import, of course, because I want to actually load the next packages. So import, import the next packages. Uh, go with the default settings with so default 32-bit, 64-bit uh, system and stuff, and then with that. Here to create these new packages. And I have to spell mix packages correctly. And now one more time. All right. Now, as I said, this query command takes quite a long time. So we'll have to wait a while. But when it eventually does list it, 
you will see there will be a, a My Packages and there will be an Emacs in there as well. And then I could just install that with Nix environment minus install My uh, Emacs, My Packages Emacs. Um, so, and you could create, you know, if you have a look at through some of those scripts, you can easily create one that packages up your program that you're working on um, and would install it and then it would wind up in the Nix store like everything else and you'd be able to run it on all the systems. So um, that concludes the talk.